How's it going guys? This is Matt from LastChanceTackle.com, Last Chance Bait and Tackle, and Last Chance Performance Green. Uh, tonight we're actually going to be doing something just a little bit different. Rather than my typical periscopes where I go into great lengthy detail about technique, mindset, all that kind of approach on the water, I'm going to show off some new product. I'm going to tie some knots for you guys, and I may open this up for general, dis general discussion. If you guys have any questions for me, it's going to be your platform to go ahead and actually say something. So, without further ado, I'm going to actually get started. But uh, the cool thing is, uh, for us in Southern California, Diamond Valley finally reopened on May 18th. It's been a long wait. It's been 13 months. Water's up to the launch ramp. We can launch our boats. So it was a very, very big success. I was out there opening day, and uh, much to my dismay, I guess you could say, I really thought there was going to be a lot of people on the water, but it turns out we only had 57 boats on the water, which is pretty random. I anticipated something in neighborhood of over 100. So... It made it for some really, really good fishing. No one stepped on anybody's toes. It was a good day of fishing. Good counts for the boats. Some boats had 30 to 50 fish. Others didn't really do so well. But as a whole, the lake is fishing exceptionally well. With 20 plus feet added to that lake, it flooded so much brush on the bank. We've talked about this in previous periscopes. We have a brush line and a grass edge out to like 20 foot of water right now. So if you want to go flip, you can go flip. You want to go throw frogs, you can throw frogs. Guys are getting spinnerbait fish, underspin fish, sanko fish. It's been really, really fun out there. And the cool thing about it, these fish have not been pressured out there. So it's kind of your, your time to test new techniques, new patterns, get a chance to do something you don't normally do. With the rising water, water clarity is dirty. We don't get to see that on Diamond Valley. We can make mistakes and still catch fish. And uh, west half of the lake, it's going through somewhat of a little algae bloom. Nothing kicked up on the surface or anything like that. But we got water that's like less than six inches visibil visibility on the west. And on the east side of the lake, we got that foot and a half to three foot of water. So you can actually do a lot of cool stuff right now. And it's a lot of fun. So definitely, I encourage you local anglers, get out to Diamond Valley. I was out there, like I said, opening day, hardly anybody. I was out there Saturday of all days, hardly anybody, there's probably like 60 boats on the water. Never once did I have to abandon the spot going like, oh man, I wish I could have fished there. Um, the winds are getting a little high up there, which makes it good for reaction bait, so I encourage you guys to get out there. So before I actually get into our knot tying, what I'm actually going to end up doing with the knots, I'm going to show you three different knots that I rely on. And that's one thing you need to actually focus on that I, I don't think a lot of people really understand. There's so many different knots on the market. Everybody feels the need to go through so many knots. So I'm going to show you three of my favorites that, that I can tie pretty much in the dark in my sleep. So I'm going to go into some baits right now. Very, very cool bait from Japan, from IMA. They came out with a rat. It's called Dis Rat, D-I-S Rat. Came out with a variety of colors. These baits come in at an ounce and a half. They're roughly six and a half to probably seven inches long. There's your chartreuse type bait right there. The funny thing about this rat, it's kind of, if, if some of you old swim baiters will remember the Rago rats, the original wood Rago rats, it's a rough copy of your Rago rat. Um, they incorporated several different features similar to the Spro rat, like the tail right here. On the Spro rat, it's a hard segmented tail. This is more of a rubber tail. It still articulates when you swim it, but it's actually a little different tail. Wider bill right there. It's going to kick back very, very heavily side to side. It's got, you know, different ears. you got got eyes, all that kind of stuff. Single hook off the belly. Very, very cool little bait. Um, obviously, we got a chartreuse bait right here. We got our gray. We got a silver bait. We got a brown bait. We got a black bait and a white bait. These baits right here, based upon that being an ounce and a half, you don't have to throw it on heavy tackle. You can get away with throwing it on a standard medium heavy to heavy action standard uh, worm and jig rod or even just a, uh, like a crankbait type rod. You don't need a swim, bait rack, a swim bait rod to throw this kind of stuff. So I'd recommend something 7.5 foot, 8 foot, if you got it, 12 to 25 pound rating. And with a reel, I mean, you can get away with a 6.3 to 1 gear ratio reel, no problem. You don't have to have a swim bait reel. It could be a Daiwa Tatula, it could be a Revo SX, it could be a Shimano Corrado. Nothing fancy. I do like to throw my particular rats when I, I like to throw them on braid. Some guys like mono, so I'll let you guys be the judge with that. Definitely a cool little bait, and it comes in at under $40. Very, very affordable bait, lightweight bait, and you can do a lot with it. It's, it's kind of in that same ballpark as your Spro BBZ Rats. Um, if you trash it, you're not out $150, $200 bucks like similar wood baits. It's a good entry-level rat for most fishing. Great tournament-style bait. Definitely check them out. They're on the website. If you go to lastchancetackle.com, um, look 
look up, I believe they're under the top water swim baits. You'll find them under just wraps uh, by Ima. Definitely look into it. Good, good bait. Another bait that I'm actually particularly excited about because I have a long history with the Jackal, the TN70 baits, the lipless crankbait. This is one of my absolutely, arguably, one of the best lipless crankbaits on the market next to the LV500. Tungsten chin right there. The bait stands upright. A lot of rattle, a lot of knock. Very good color. This one's actually called Super Shad. I've done a lot of damage with this particular lipless crankbait right here. It's one of my favorites. But the cool thing is they came out, Jackal came out with another bait. That one's actually made by Jackal, but so is this. They came out with a TN70. They came out with a disc rattle. And what this is, as compared to your standard TN70s, this has a bunch of bunch of rattles on the inside. It sounds like if you were to put rocks in a tin can and start shaking them all crazy. The disc rattle has one singular rattle on the inside, about the same size of an aspirin tablet. It has a different knock. It's more of a thud, similar to, let's say, uh, a Norman crankbait. It's a lower frequency noise. So when faced with clear water situations, high pressured fish, it's not as uh, intrusive to the fish as you come through that same territory. Now I'm going to put both side by side, that way you can hear it. This right here is your standard TN70, which is fine, caught a lot of fish with it. Very loud, typical like any lipless crankbait, very, very noisy. As compared to the disc rattle, it's a lower frequency. Definitely something I don't think a lot of you guys have seen or maybe you didn't even know they came out with them. I would definitely look into them and they actually have two colors I'm actually pretty stoked on. I had a chance to fish them on Saturday at Diamond Valley just to see. I mean they fish pretty much identical to the old ones but the cool thing about it, this one right here is called Sparkle Wakasaki or Sprinkle Wakasaki. Very very cool bait. It's almost like a, a transparent bluegill pattern. Pink stripe down the side. Looks like a trout pattern but in my mind in most of the lakes around here it looks very very bluegilly. This one right here is called the Flash Gill right here. Cool, cool little bait. Very realistic baits with that lower frequency knock. I think that you guys are going to find good success in much, much of our, you know, Southern California pressure waters, even somewhere back east. And that so, brings up a good question. He asked, when would you use a higher frequency over lower? Yeah, it depends on the activity level of the fish. Now, if I'm dealing with dirtier water conditions, I'm faced with that less than a foot visibility, muddy conditions. I want noise, I want vibration. I want to f give a fish a reason to track that bait down. With a quieter bait in dirtier water, those fish have a harder time to locate a bait. They're still gonna feel it with their lateral lines, but giving them that noise sometimes makes it easier for those fish to find the baits, much similar to throwing white, white and chartreuse spinner baits in dirtier water. Now, down here in Southern California, if you're not in this area, we have a lot of angling pressure. Such few lakes, small lakes, Lots of tournament anglers, lots of hardcore bass heads. So when you deal with that lower frequency noise, you can come in behind anglers. And I feel that by having a bait like this, even though I'm still young on this bait, I feel I can come through areas that have been hit heavily with you know standard techniques. And I feel I might be able to generate a reaction strike and not actually kind of mess with the fish, not spook them out from my spot. So definitely off color water, I like to use a lot more flash, a lot more rattle, a lot more vibrant colors. Clearer water, more high pressure waters, I would go to more of a subtle type bait like this. Now, when I throw my lipless crankbaits, a lot of guys vary in their, their rods, their reels, their line. Me particularly, if I'm dealing with dirty water conditions, I'll throw straight braid. I don't have a problem doing that because I can throw it out there. I can feel what my bait's doing at all times. Um, I got on a bite a few years back over at a local lake called Lake Skinner where I had it to myself. It was October, November-ish. Uh, grass was starting to die off and I was actually fan casting open water flats and I would try to find uh, whatever was left for the grass. So I'd fire that bait out there, I'd burn that bait back in, I'd find the grass and I'd rip it through the grass. Right as soon as I would rip it through the grass I'd get hammered and I had a crazy crazy day, the best day of bass fishing in my life. I sat on a spot for two hours and picked them off every couple casts if not every cast. Now, most guys will fish monofilament or fluorocarbon lines. What that's going to do for you, in my opinion, is it's going to hinder your ability to feel what your bait's doing at all times. With mono, it muffles the actual, uh, it muffles the vibration of the bait. You're still going to feel the bait rattle, but all you're going to feel is a little bit of mush. With braid, because you know braid has the non-stretch characteristic, when I fire a bait out there, I feel the rattles. I feel that bait. 
whenever it dis whenever I come in contact with grass, a tree, whatever's attached to my bait, it slows the whole action down, and I know it right away. That's when I can snap my rod. Very, very responsive. And I throw these particular baits, you know, like a seven and a half foot rod. I like a, a composite type rod, graphite glass. With straight braid, I know something's got to give, so I don't want to rip holes out of the fish's face. So I would go with a composite type rod on a 6.3 to 1 gear ratio reel. It allows me to wind into that bite, and that softer action rod gives me the cushion so I don't, like I said, rip the holes out of the fish's face, or vice versa, allow them to jump. So definitely take a look at the, the flat knocker, or the disc knocker right here. Low frequency noise. We have it in several colors. Like I said, the two colors that I fell in love with are uh, the Sprinkle Shad and then the Flash Gill. I think it's called Sprinkle Shad. Let me just double check. Yeah, I think it's Sprinkle. Yeah, it's Sprinkle Shad. I don't want to sound stupid on there. But, uh, yeah, definitely look into those. If you're more traditional, you're dealing with dirtier water situations, standard TN70s, it's much similar to your standard, you know, standard uh, Bill Lewis rattle traps. They offer a TN60, too, which is a little bit smaller. Um, very similar to your standard quarter ounce Bill Lewis rattle traps, but I definitely like these baits. Very, very competitive bait to the Lucky Craft LV500s. And you're going to find guys that will really like the LVs. That's fine. I fell in love with the Jackals. I'm so loyal to that bait. It's caught me a lot of fish. So going into our Periscope, um, this one actually is going to be a little bit different, like I said in, in the beginning of it. This one's going to be geared towards knot tying. I'm not going to talk about the baits, this, that, and the other as much as I normally would. I'm going to talk about knots that I tie on a regular basis to keep things simple for me. And one of the biggest questions we get called on, asked about online or in the shop is, I need a good knot for braid to leader. Now, to some of us, we've been tying braid to leader for a lot of years, and we already kind of have our system down to a science. But for a lot of guys, they, they don't fish braid because they're afraid that they don't know how to tie that knot. They're afraid they're going to lose their expensive bait. So I'm going to show you a couple different knots that I like to tie. Um, and I'm also going to show you a simple knot that I tie just about every lure that I fish on standard techniques. This is stuff where if you're dealing with windy conditions, Southern California, um, you don't have a lot of time. If we're hugging the bank, one of my tactics that I do on all the local lakes um, is I like to fish high and tight a lot. When I'm fishing standard techniques, unlike swim baits, I'll put the boat like right on the shore and I'll power cast down the bank. So if I break off, I have to re-tie. I need something that I can tie quick without having to look at my hands to tie because I have the fear of running my boat onto the shoreline. We have a lot of wind, we have a lot of waves, that's the last thing you want to do. It, especially, I mean, last, last Chance Performance Green graced me with the ability to fish out of a new Skeeter FX20 LE. I don't want to put that boat on the rocks, that's a beautiful boat, so having the ability to tie knots quick in windy conditions will be in your benefit. So the first knot I'm actually going to show you is going to be a simple knot that most everybody probably knows but then again some of you might not know um, I fell in, I used to tie a lot of uh, double improved clinch knots and standard clinch knots I was never a fan of Palomar or any of that kind of stuff because I don't want to waste time while I'm fishing so the first knot I'm going to show you is actually my standard knot for everything from worms to jigs spinner baits everything by having one single knot that I like to tie for the stuff it cuts a lot of the the crap out of the equation. I don't have to say, okay, well, this bait gets a double clinch knot. This one gets a Palomar knot. I tie a simple knot. It's called the uni knot. Now, some of you guys may know it. I'm using a hook like this. It just so happens I actually stuck one of these in my thumb at one point in time in my life. I had to go to the doctor, but anyway. So what you're going to do is grab your hook. Insert. I'm going to show this a couple different times. Insert your line to the eye of the hook just like this. What I like to do is I pinch the line together just like this, giving myself six to ten inches of tag line hanging off. What I do is I roll that tag end around. And this is where it gets kind of funny, and I, I can't stress controlling your line enough. I wrap it around, and I put my finger, my middle finger of my right hand, inside that loop, holding the loop in place, allowing me to be able to manipulate my fingers without having any unnecessary tag hanging off. So I'll insert my, back to square one, I'll insert my fishing line through the eye of the hook just like this. I'll come tight just like this, and I roll it around, creating a loop just like that. I have my two middle fingers in there holding that loop open at all times. I take my tag in, and I'm going to roll it around the two standing lines right here. I'm going to go up six times. One, two, three four, five, six times. 
by having the utmost control right here, I know what my line's doing. I don't have any, any unnecessary loops anywhere. So I let go and I slowly cinch that knot up, allowing each of the individual wraps to cinch in place. I can't stress that part enough. Allow the lines to lay side by side. If your lines overlap like that, as you put tension on it, say you set the hook, find a big fish, you can run the risks of the line cutting into itself, therefore snapping you off. So once I'm cinched up there, I don't cinch it all the way. I get it kind of loose and I'll slide that down. Very important when you're tying any knot, wet your line because like with, with the fluorocarbon lines, it'll actually burn fraying your main line up. So I'll cinch it down to just about snug. I grab all the lines together and I cinch it up just like that. Now, it's very important when you're doing these knots and stuff like that, never cut your tag in super, super short. I always allow a little bit of tag sticking out just like that. The thing about that is no matter how tight we tighten our knots, when you're pulling on a fish, say you get snagged, you're pulling up, your knot will always cinch up more than it actually is right there. We can't pull enough pressure a lot of times to have it cinch up. So this right here was the uni knot. I'm going to tie it one more time. <coughs> I'm actually going to show you again. That way in case some of you miss it. Most of you guys are going to know this knot, but I can't stress the fact that this has been such a nice knot for me. Have little issues whatsoever. Actually, I never had an issue with this knot. Freshwater, saltwater. I pulled on big tuna with this knot. I've done a lot of cool things with it. Um, got my personal best yellowtail, just under 50 pounds on this knot, straight braid. So again, we're going to do it one more time. Yeah, somebody was saying it was blurry. So sorry, trying to yeah, make sure one. we focus. This is our first time doing knots, so yeah, we weren't bear sure. with us. So I'll go slow. I think it's the faster I do it, a little more blurry. So anyway, I'm going to insert the line through the eye of the hook, just like that. I'm going to come up and pinch both lines together, just like this. I'm going to wrap my tag end around and I like to put my two fingers, two middle fingers in that loop to hold everything in place, just like this. I'm going to take my tag end and I'm going to wrap it around the two standing lines, just like this. I'm going to do six times. I'm wrapping this direction, wrapping up towards the top of your line, towards your rod tip. I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, and six times, just like that. This is where I would wet the line. Just add a little spit to it, it doesn't hurt nothing. Slowly cinch that knot up, allowing each individual wrap to lay side by side, just like that. Now say it doesn't line up side by side. Say, say you get to that point, you're like, oh man, it just kind of balled up. Yes, you only go through the hook eye once. One time through the hook eye. Now, some guys will believe that double hook, double line through the hook guy is going to be a much better knot. you got to think of it this way, and this is where I've always battled with anglers talking about that right there. You may have two lines around that hook guy, but you got one solitary main line. That's one thing right there that I've always argued with people, and you cinch it up just like this. So it's a very, very simple knot. I just have adopted a different practice to this particular knot to allow it easier for me. Rather than sit there like a lot of anglers will do, they'll put the eye through here, just like this. They're gonna come up, and they're gonna try to manipulate that line around here. Yeah, you can do it, it's fine. I figured if I have ultimate control in this right here, it's helped me considerably in tying these knots. So I'm gonna come up, wrap the line around, put my middle finger, middle finger in here to lock it. I'm gonna wrap the standing line around the two main lines that I put together, one, two, three, four, five, and six times. This is something I can tie in the dark. I can tie while watching negotiating swell waves on the ocean or whatever. Even I can tie it. It's pretty easy. Very, very easy knot. And I, if you stop into the shop, I can do a sit-down demonstration with you guys if you guys are local. Simple knot right there. And like I said before, after you're done tying that individual knot. It's a uni knot. This is a uni knot. After I tie that individual knot, I'll always give myself a little bit of line like that because no matter how much I cinch this knot down, it will always slip a little bit like any knot will. There's not one single knot on the market that won't slip. Very, 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 very good knot. I tie it for literally, literally everything I do with the exception of, uh, obviously with the exception of drop shotting where I'll tie a Palomar knot 
or you know bigger bigger swim baits where I tie with different types of line. The uni knot is a very very efficient knot for me and my arsenal. So that's a knot I tie for like I said general general use situations. Now what happens when I tie when I tie a leader on there? Okay, there's so many different knots on the market or on the, on the internet right now. They got the FG knot. You got Roy or you got uh, Alberto knot, the Bob Sands knot. All these different knots that guys are showing you, so it's making it very, very hard for the novice angler to say, well, what's the best knot? What do I tie? So I tie a simple all bright knot. And one thing about all my knots that I do is I keep my rotations and my wraps very close together. Um, like with this particular knot, the uni knot, I like six rotations, six to seven rotations. With my all bright knot, which I'm about ready to show you, I like six to seven rotations as well. Everything's the same, everything's simple. If I'm dealt with nighttime conditions, I'm in the dark, I forgot my headlamp, I need to be able to tie these knots if I'm going to try to fish my braid to leader or braid straight to the bait. So I keep everything very, very tight in my arsenal. I, I like to control every controllable I have. So right now I'm actually going to tie for you my joining knot to join braid to monofilament. And I am tying on a little heavier line right now. I got like 80 pound braid, I think I'm tying to 20. It's not that heavy, but this is a very, very good knot when dealing with saltwater fishing, which we're gonna be getting ready to get into. And the cool thing about, like I said, this periscope right here is I'm gonna give open it up to questions and answers at the end where we can kind of have fun right now. You guys can talk and ask me questions about a little bit of everything we're doing or stuff that I haven't talked, swim baits, whatever. So the first thing I'll do, hopefully you'll be able to see this. And like I said, if you can't see it, stop in the Last Chance Tackle, um, the bait shop, or hit me up on Facebook under Matt Magno, and I'm be more than happy to give you a demonstration, kind of walk you through this. So when I'm joining my leader to my braid, I'm going to start off with my monofilament right here. Hopefully you'll be able to see this on the periscope. This has always been kind of a weird thing with the blur. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a loop with my leader line, just like this. And if, make, make sure you speak up if you can't see it because I may be able to grab some different line where you can't be able to see it. So I'm going to create a loop. And one thing I do with this loop to control my controllables is I'll take this loop and I'll wrap it around my middle finger just like that. That keeps my loop in place as I'm manipulating. Hopefully I'm not flipping you guys off. I'm not trying to, guys. No, Mark's joking about his, his, if we can spill 75 yards of braid. I guess full 75 pounds a yard. <laughs> yeah, you just slipped me up. You got me. Consider it a success, Mark. You got me. So anyway, so here's your leader. Here's your braid. What I like to do is I insert my braid from the bottom and end up through my leader, just like this. And all I'm going to do to control my controllables, I'm going to put my middle finger in that loop, holding it in place. I'm going to work that braid up to the top towards my rod tip and all I do is I cinch that down with my finger hold it in place I'm gonna double back now hopefully I'll let it adjust I'm gonna double back now I'm gonna wrap my tag end around all three lines both sides of the loop and my braid I'm gonna go one for every wrap that I make I'm gonna make sure I cinch that knot and seat that knot before it's actually cinched two cinch it down three cinch it down four five six times now you're left with a big loop right here you got your tag in hanging low just like that Oops. if you can see right here my knot is already cinched up before I even actually cinch my whole knot down so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna insert my tag in back through the knot this makes it super easy for me back through the loop that I'm holding with my middle finger which I'm going to tie this knot again. That way you can actually get it. And all I do is slowly cinch it up till it barely comes tight, just like this. And I give it a go. Just like that. Super, super small knot. Very it's on small. the white. So I'm going to actually do it. That was a, we're trying to figure out, Megan's all like, you sure you're going to be able to tie knots with the background? I'm like, I'm going to try it out. So I'm going to cinch it down. I'm going to actually cut my tag in to allow you guys to see and don't laugh at me right now because I swear my vision is getting worse and worse by the day. I'm doing this number right here trying to cut my tag ends. So I'm going to cut my tag ends just like that. If you can see this, we're going to put it over the black right here. Very small knot right there. Comes to the guides exceptionally well. And this is 80 pound test spliced to 20 pound leader. 
Very, very simple knot. I find that this knot is one of the easiest ones to tie. Once you get your fingers to work correctly, it's a very, very easy knot to tie. Now, I will actually cut my monofilament tag in, as you can see right there, just down a little bit more. That way it doesn't hang up, but I can throw this through a lot of smaller guides. I fish uh, a lot of Mega Bass Orochi Double X rods, and they have kind of that modified micro guide. And I find that I'm still able to shoot this line exceptionally well. I tie this knot for throwing Gancraft 178s, 230s, all that kind of stuff. I fished it with the 250. I've done a lot of cool stuff with this. Um, and had very good success fishing offshore, fishing tuna and stuff like that with this knot. Very, very strong knot. So I'm going to tie this again in case you guys missed it. This is kind of, knots are always the hardest thing to teach because it requires uh, first hand to do it. Let me actually, I'm going to tie the knot closer up here. That way you don't get that white background from the Last Chance logo. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a loop with my leader line. This could be floral, this could be mono, it could be whatever. I'm going to make that loop and wrap it around my middle finger. And what I'm going to do while doing that, like I said before, it controls that loop. If I did not wrap that around my finger, as I'm tying, my hand will get slipped further and further apart. And I'm starting to reach for my leader, and then it makes the whole thing just go to crap. So make a loop, wrap it around my middle finger just like this. I'm going to take my, my braid. I'm going to insert from the bottom up just like that and put my finger in that loop, controlling my line, controlling my controllables. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give myself ample working room and I'm gonna pinch my braid up in these fingers just like that, allowing that to actually stay in place, allowing me to easily work. I'm gonna take my tag end and wrap around my braid and both of the standing loop part of my mono, my leader. One, I'm gonna cinch it down. One, two, Three, four, five, and six times. As you can see right there, I'm going to let go a little bit, but you can see how that knot is already, for the most part, cinched up. Very, very important you control that. Because that's going to allow all those loops, all those wraps to lay evenly. Again, like I said with the uni knot, if you don't allow those to lay evenly, you run the risk of them biting into each other, snapping you off, or having failures. So I'm going to actually go back through the bottom of that loop, just like this. Bite it. That's where you would wet your line. Obviously, I'm not. I'm just doing it for the sake of the demonstration. Wet my line and slowly cinch it up. You can see all the loops lay even, just like that. I'm going to give it a pull, just like that. Seat that knot before it even cinches up. And all I'm going to do is cut my tag ends. like that and there you have it a small Albright knot it'll go through the guides exceptionally well you can use it on spinning rods and when I'm doing my braid to my leader connections some guys like to have this particular knot in their reel I find that a no-go no-go whatsoever because if you wind that up in your bait casting reel say you got 10 feet 15 feet 20 feet in there when you go to cast that right there will butt up against your level wine guide and it'll actually sometimes stop, therefore you casting your bait off. So I encourage everybody, it's the same with any rod you use. Tie this knot, basically have your line spool sitting away. Say this is your rod right here. I'll actually wind that knot to the tip of my rod. And all I do is I grab my leader spool, come down even with my reel and cut it right there. What that's doing is well, by the time you tie your knot, tie your bait on there, whatever you're going to be doing, by the time you wind up to make your cast, your knot will always be outside of your level wind, eliminating any problem for failure. Now, when I'm doing braid to leader, I try not to, I try not to recommend it for guys that like to fish micro guides. Um, even though that is a small knot right there, when dealing with micro guides, let me actually let me run and get a rod real quick. Where are our micro guides? Okay, let me get a rod real quick. See me prancing around the store. When dealing with micro guides, I don't know if you can see these particular guides right here. Very, very small. If you look at the size of that knot, there's almost no knot that'll go through a micro guide. So be very, very careful in dealing with that. 
as you can see, I don't know if you can get a good view of that. You look at the size of the knot, look at the size of the guide right there, it's just not going to happen. Break baits off. Okay, so there you have it. Two basic knots I like to tie. We got the Uni knot, we got the Albright knot. There's so many different knots available that you can tie, but to be confident with your system, eliminate all the crap, okay? Out of breath, I was running around the store. <laughs> So you got the uni knot, got the Albright knot. These two particular knots right here, I can tie in the dark. I don't need a headlamp to tie them. If I'm dealing with those windy situations, I'm sloshing around Diamond Valley, broke off in a tree on a windblown point, and I'm sitting there upwind of my spot right there. I need to have a knot. I can sit there and whip these things together. I mean, it's as simple as I'm sitting there going like, oh, crap, I need to tie a leader. I can sit there and run it through, just tie it like this. bust them out sit there and cut my tag ends I can be pretty darn quick with it boom 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 go and all I gotta do is cut my tag ends back in the water tie my bait on I'm fast very very essential now the other knot that I wanted to show you is one that I've actually found out uh, I've, last season I'm big on tying knots in last chance because like we have to tie knots for a living Okay, we have to find the perfect knot because we have to give it to our customers. If we give out a faulty knot, we're going to have a reputation of tying bad knots. We can't afford that. So what I like to do, and so does Anthony, we like to test different theories out. We want to use it on our own gear because we don't care if we lose fish. It's a fact of the matter. It's, it is what it is. So we're going to go out there. We're going to test different knots. We're going to beat them up. And we're going to figure out what is the best and what can we tie. So last year I was doing a lot of kayak fishing uh, in, down in La Jolla, fishing big yellowtail and stuff like that. So I stumbled upon a knot I actually kind of was intrigued by. It was called like a Bob Sands knot or a uh, Tony Pena knot. What it was, it was a locking knot that was a singular knot instead of tying what we call bimini twists to Albrights. Instead of having two different knots joining your braid to leader for saltwater heavy fish, big fish, it was one single knot that had a locking effect, just like a uni to uni knot. So I went out there and I was fishing a lot of 50 pound braids spliced to 40 pound test fluorocarbon. Short top shots, little guys, just like this. And my whole, my whole purpose and my whole theory was I want to blow these knots up. I want to find the failure in the knots. Rather than find out if they're good, I want to find out how they break. So I spent a lot of time fishing really, really tight drags, horsing these yellowtail up. I don't know if you've seen the videos on, uh, on YouTube, lastchancetackle.com. Last Chance There's a lot of yellowtail videos of me and my kayak just really really jacking on these fish and I found a knot that was super super strong never had one single failure so I'm actually gonna walk it on over to our line spooling machine and show you granted I will be tying with 80 pound you know 80 pound top shot to 80 pound floral I'm gonna actually show you over here so if Megan can follow me over here we're gonna tie the Bob Sands or Tony Pena knot very very strong connection knot that I found to hold up very very well this is the finished product. Let me move my phone. This is the finished product right here. But I'm going to show you how I tie it. It looks funny having it bunched up like that, but it's a very, very clean knot. And this is obviously heavier pound test than you would fish, traditional style. But it's a very, very stout knot. Goes through the guides exceptionally well, and it is, does not break. So what I'm going to do, this is actually one setup that I was working on today. I'm going to cut my tag, cut my leader, and the cool thing about this, this is the same exact starting knot that I showed you tying my hook. So what I'm going to do is I overlap my leader. This is my leader, obviously that's my main line, Spectra, Mono. I'm going to overlap my Mono on to my Spectra. And I actually did, an art, or did a blog on LastChanceTackle.com showing a step-by-step -step in picture form of how to tie this knot. So I overlap the two lines together, much similar to tying a uni knot or any type of braid to leader connection. I'm going to take my mono right here. Can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Take my mono, and I'm going to tie a uni knot. I'm going to make a loop just like this, and I'm going to insert this through this loop and around my spectra four times. I'm going to reach through the loop. One, two, three four times just like that and I'm going to cinch up very important I found that you don't want to cinch up all the way just firm enough where it wants to bind and sit just like that I gather myself control my controllables like I can't stress enough 
give myself a little bit. Just like this, it still allows it to slide. I'm gonna give myself enough tag in to manipulate it. So what I like to do, I pinch this joining part right here. And I'm gonna show you what that does after I get to the second stage, or third stage. I pinch right here, just like that, and I let my tag in lay. I'm gonna rotate my tag in up the line 14 times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now it's very important, I give myself enough space and enough looseness in here for I can manipulate that braid later on. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, I went up 14 times. Now I'm gonna pinch where I stopped, just like this. I'm gonna pinch right here and let go here. If you notice, my joining part where I initially pinched that braid to start my rotation up created a loop. That's gonna come in handy at the very end. I don't know if we've tied, if you guys tied knots before where you actually kind of cinch the knot before and you're like, oh crap, you're pulling on it. This alleviated that, so it actually made it a lot better. So now that I went up 14 times, I'm gonna come back down 14 times. One, two, right on top. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I'm glad I can count. Okay, so now that you're down to the bottom end like that, all I'm going to do is insert my braid through that loop I created by pinching it, just like this. And there you're done. So now I'm going to grab my standing main line and slowly pull up. And if you watch, if you watch, it'll slowly bind itself together. Just like that. You created a weave on top of the mono, almost the same diameter as that mono. Very, very slim knot right here. And then I actually grab my tag end and I cinch it, or my tag end of my mono and cinch it down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut my tags on both the mono and the braid, again, leaving ample room in case it wants to cinch up further. Now this may be a boring periscope to some, but others can actually find use in it. But what I'm going to do is grab my mono right here, and this is where it comes in handy to have a lighter in your pocket. I pinch on top of my knot. This is where you can't be afraid to burn your fingers. And I actually take it and I melt, I don't know if you can see that. I melt that mono down and I flatten it. What that does, it almost creates a nail effect. So if for some reason that knot actually wants to slip for some reason, no one to me, I don't know, it actually has a stopping point that sometimes may be the last resort in landing your big fish. Never had it slip once, but a very, very small knot, very clean knot. Now as you can see, being that my mono is right here, that first knot with the uni knot right there acts as a lock. So when you're pulling on this, it's pulling against itself. The tighter and harder you pull, the tighter that knot gets. Very, very, very strong knot, much different than the standard Albright knot. Now, if anybody wanted to see that again, I can tie the whole system one more time. Be, you know, speak up if you do. I don't know if anybody you care about that knot, but in smaller pound tests, it works very, very good for swim bait fishing because your knot will be super, super small. I've actually tied it a lot, tested it freshwater style, fishing braid to leader for, and I've actually dropped the amount of twist and went seven up, seven down, locked it, actually worked out very, very well, but it's a very, very good knot for tying braid to leader. So that one actually right there is called the Bob Sands knot, Tony Pena. There's so many different knots based around the same system. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk back over here to my starting spot, and I'm going to give you a little bit of time to maybe compile some questions. I'm going to leave it open to you. Do you guys want to talk about swim bait fishing? We can talk swim bait fishing. I'm going to give you guys, we've never done that before, and I wanted to actually kind of incorporate a little bit of that platform for you guys to speak up. Do you guys want to know about Diamond Valley? Any tips, tricks? Here's your time. I'm going to open it up, and then uh, if we don't have any questions, I'm going to finish off by talking a little about Last Chance Performance Marine, and then we'll go from there. So if you have any questions for me about anything, Rigging huds, fishing the mother, your avenue to talk. Probably not. <laughs>
Most people probably probably close off to those. Don't need to know about knots. Knots are so important. Yeah, knots are your, the most critical link between you and the fish. You don't have a good knot on there. You're not efficient with your knot. That's just leaving room for error. When I throw the rolling main mother, I throw 30 pound test. And I know that I'm throwing $450, almost $500 out into the water. If I don't have a good knot on there, I just cast it in my bait off. It's stupid. Definitely know some good knots, uh, whatever it be, the Albright knot, the Uni knot, the Bob Sands or Tony Pena knot. It's critical, especially with right now, weather's still kind of cold, but we got fish brewing offshore. We got bluefin coming up. There's big yellow tails. Yellow tail. Pretty soon, we're going to have the tuna up here. You need to know some good core knots because you don't want a cat to keep saying, hey, deckhand, tie me my knot. But uh, definitely pretty cool. And as you know, like since no one's really speaking up with questions or anything. There is one about what knot do you prefer for flipping. Uh, I use the uni knot or the snell knot. Now, it totally depends. And I can actually show you the snell knot if you really wanted to. But uh, when I'm flipping and stuff like that, I've always been a uni knot guy. And I've always fished standard offset. I fish a wide gap plus owner. And relatively recently, I've kind of flirted with the whole flipping hook and the snail, the straight shank hook, and I really, really like its benefits. And the snail knot, it has a lock effect. So what you'll do is insert your bobber stopper up your main line, insert your weight, punch stop, or punch skirt, whatever, and you snail the knot. So when in contact with the weight hits that actual hook, it kicks that hook out, you know, pretty much, a, I guess it would be a 45 degree angle in the top of the fish's face. Snell knot's a really, really good flip hook or flip knot, but I definitely, if I'm dealing with sparse cover, I don't really care about that stuff. I tie a uni knot as well. And definitely braid. I mean, I flip a lot around here, but not the way most people consider flipping like they do back east, Midwest, whatever. We don't have a lot, a lot of heavy cover here. We got sparse trees, we've got grass, so a lot of our stuff is open. We don't need ounce and a half to two ounce weights. We're flipping three eighths, we're flipping half ounce. So I don't find it critical for me to use that snell knot at all situations. A lot of it's more finesse pitching around here. So I find that the uni knot with a standard EWD style hook is more, more efficient. <coughs> I don't think there's going to be too, too many questions. So uh, as you guys know, uh, you probably see me freaking out on the internet black. Palomar knot, what techniques in your opinion? Palomar knot, I only use the Palomar knot for one thing, and I, I drop shot. <laughs> you know, it's almost like uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Yes, my name's Matt Magnum, and I drop shot. You don't know me, but uh, I don't talk about it a lot, but I, I, I drop shot. But uh, I find that that knot's a very, very easy knot to tie in the drop shot. You can still fish a uni knot. You can do a San Diego knot. You can tie whatever you want, but for Palomar knots, I like the drop shot. I've tried it with everything. I went through my phase where I... Gave every knot the benefit of the doubt. I started off throwing clinch knots, double clinch knots. I went to San Diego jam knots. I've been through a lot of different knots to find a knot that's efficient for me. Um, the Palomar knot, you can't argue with it. It's got high breaking strength. But the one thing that I tell every customer coming and asking, what's your favorite knot? Well, what do you tie for Spectra? That your knot's only as good as your ability to tie your knot. If you can't tie whatever knot is you, you can right, your knot's not going to be a good knot. So whatever knot you like, own that knot and fish it hard. Uh, but I find that the, you know, the Palomar's a good knot. But for me, for speed, even though the Palomar knot's about the same speed, or same speed, I find the uni knot, I can tie that in my sleep, fire bait out there, and go. And I know I don't have any issues with that whole system. And it's all about confidence. Whatever you're confident in is going to work. Just like anything. I mean, like we always think and we always hear, yeah, when you're fishing a tournament, you're fishing a lake, and you're stressing. Your, your, everything in your fishing in your life, everything's out of whack. When you're fishing, it's almost like those fish can feel it. you got to have confidence. Every one of you have been to that position where you're going down the lake with a trolling motor or on the shore, and you just know before you make that cast, you fire up to that tree edge, you're like, I'm going to get bit right now. I'm going to get bit. So you're going to fish that bait in the in the way that you're going to get bit. You know that fish is there. You're shaking your twitch. Oh, i got to wait. i got to wait. Oh, here he's going to come. Here he comes. You can almost walk that fish on there. It's confidence. So that same amount of confidence you have in your fishing abilities should be the same amount of confidence you have in your equipment and your knots. You don't have confidence, you're just not going to have a good day, um, and you're probably going to make mistakes. You don't want to make mistakes because out here on the West Coast, our lakes generally are pressured waters. you got 50 million guys still in the same exact bait on the same exact spot 
almost at the same exact time. We call them community holes around here. And our lakes aren't big. So you got to have your A game on because you have five strikes, basically, or three strikes. You know, you make one mistake, there goes one. Make another, boom, you had a bad day. So make sure that you control all of your controllables, just like Kevin Van Dam said. Definitely a good piece of advice. The mark? Just the look, look on your face. Oh. oh, here's a good one. What knot do you use to tie up the new skeeter to the dock? I tie the, I hope to God it's not going to hit the dock knot. Because I don't want that gel coat cracking. That's one thing right there. Like I was getting ready to go into. <laughs> uh, you've seen me freaking out online. Facebook, Instagram. I was blessed with the opportunity to run a brand new 2016. Skeeter FX20 LE. And I've always been in aluminum boats for my whole life. You know, I started off like everybody. I found interest in fishing, walking the shorelines. My dad had, was in a bass club. He fish tournaments. So I had a boat at home. It was always been an aluminum boat. So I, I was always fishing aluminum boats. I learned to love aluminum, knowing that, hey, I'll never have a glass boat. I don't come from a lot of money. I'm just a bass fisherman that loves what I do. So Megan, Dan, Mike, and Lynn gave me an opportunity to run a Phoenix, and I about blew, I almost blew a hole in the back of my pants because I freaked the hell out. So yeah, so over, down, over there, over at Last Chance Performance for Reen, uh, we just took on Skeeter Bass Boats. We have everything from the, the ZX-190 all the way up to the FX-21 FX LE, and all pretty much all models in between, FX, or the S, or ZX-200, ZX-250. Um, it's just amazing over there. Definitely go shoot over to Last Chance Performance Marine, talk to Dan or Mike Peterson. They can give me a walkthrough on the whole line of boats. I'm still freaking out. My mean machine over there, the Green Hornet, just sitting over there. I, I want to go right now and go play in that boat. I've cleaned the thing like six times before it even hit the water. Been out twice, and I'm still freaking out to tie it to the dock. So it's a good thing. Very, very good people over there. Uh, in addition to Skeeter, as you guys all know, we have Phoenix. We have Lund. We have Low Boats. And they're actually, speaking of which, there is a boat inside the showroom right now you guys might want to take a look at. It's the Low Fishing Machine 165. It's got a galvanized trailer. Um, it's got fore and aft aerated live wells. Carpeted top decks, vinyl floor down below. It's got a 20-inch transom, um, trolling motor on the bow, rod storage, lockable rod storage. Definitely something for our local waters, fishing the kelp edge, fishing offshore, as well as fishing stripers on the river in the lakes. Um, definitely go over there. You might be surprised on this model. If you hop on to Facebook, find me, Matt Magnone on Facebook, or Last Chance Performance Marine or Dan Merchant, look for them on there. You'll see the, the posts that I put up showing pictures of this individual boat. It's the perfect little SoCal skiff. Um, being that we're, getting, we're constantly getting different boats in the shop, talk to Mike over there. You might be surprised. You might be able to walk away with that boat for a pretty good price. Um, and if you have any questions on any of the Skeeter line, I'm doing, really, I'm doing a lot of research on these boats, getting, getting in depth with these things. I've had my boat out there. I've analyzed every little square inch of my Phoenix, of my Skeeter, and I'm freaking out. You know, there's some cool features on there. Rigid Industries LED lights, backup lights. It's got a blower that blows through each compartment to clear moisture air, or to blow air on your baits. You're fishing Havasu. It's hot out. Put that blower on. It's going to blow air in your bike, air in your thing. I'm freaking out. I've had aluminum boat my whole life. I've never had anything like that. So. Definitely stop on over there. If you have any questions, contact me over here at Last Chance Bait and Tackle, 951-658-7410. Um, contact Last Chance Performance Marine, 951-765-1800. Talk to Dan or Mike. They can get you set up. And speaking of that, we are going to be doing a barbecue over at the boat shop Saturday evening. Dan just mentioned it. Um, so anybody that wants to come out, I believe we're offering if you want to be able to sleep there instead of dealing with trying to stay in line at Diamond Valley. Um, we're opening up the parking lot for everyone to sleep there. But if anything, definitely come down and join us for the barbecue. I'm not sure what time we're starting it at, so if Dan wants to chime in there and tell me what time. And I'll be over there, too, for anybody that wants to go look inside my rod compartments or look at the baits that are on there. I'm sure people won't look. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, cruise over there. I'll be hanging out over there as well as everybody else from Last Chance Bait and Tackle. There to hang out just have a good time. You know, talk customers, all that kind of good stuff. Around 5, so perfect, because we close at 5. So One thing I did want to say to you guys is 
If you guys are in the in the market to repower your boat, Mercury's got a program that Last Chance Performance Marine's doing. Um, they're basically having a factory repower rebate. Talk to Dan over there. I believe it's up to twelve hundred dollars in rebates. You might want to have Dan might want to chime in right there. But it's a pretty good little program in case you're sitting there with a two-stroke boat saying, "Man, I really want to go fish Diamond Valley, but I can't get on the lake." Dan over there at Last Chance Performance Marine. Same with Mike. They can hook you up and get you in the right path as to how to go about getting a new motor for your, you know, your older boat or your boat with a two-stroke model. So definitely something they can do over there. So, and then uh, speaking of that, even though it is a Mercury rebate, we also do Yamaha. Absolutely. Um, the day mark is Saturday. So this coming Saturday evening at Last Chance Performance Marine. And I got Sunday off and I'm going fishing. I'm going to get that green order on that water and oof catching bass i've been so freaking so freaked out about doing anything to that boat yet i still have not had one day where i've actually unloaded on diamond valley i've been barely going next to trees because i don't want to scratch it barely docking it up that i left the lake at 11 30 on saturday because i was afraid to put that boat against 15 mile an hour chop so sunday friday and then sunday i'm gonna unleash on that lake i i need mine I, need, I watched everybody get theirs, 9-pounders, 8-pounders, 7-pounders. I want myself a big fish. <laughs> so I figure that's probably about it for this periscope. If you do have any questions, shout it out. Uh, but uh, we always thank you for your business, and we definitely look forward to helping you guys become better anglers and just help you out in any way. Yeah, definitely give us feedback as far as the not thing, which since we're signing off, Oh yeah, um, with this, let us know how that periscope went. We uh, we want to do more instructional stuff as opposed to me just sitting here. I like to set up on a tree line and fire a bait out here and do this little shimmy and dance around like a like a freak or whatever. We want to do more instructional stuff to help you as well as show you some cool baits in the shop. So if you want to see some new tackle, you want to see more instruction on how we rig a plastic worm, how we tie up a flip you know punch rig or whatever. We're trying to find avenues where we can actually do these videos and periscopes to make it so you guys can see it. So definitely let us know. We need some feedback to say, hey, did it come out clear? Uh, we're working on different systems as far as different cameras, maybe even going to GoPro. So if you have any ideas, bounce them back to us. Call us at the shop. Hit us up on Facebook, lastchancetackle.com, lastchanceperformancemarine. Call us at the shop, 951-658-7410, and we got you covered. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.